So um, this, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Fikile Kumala to our university. Um, we're very lucky actually to have her here. And it's really um, because she's part of a project on decolonizing childhood discourses, which um, is run by Karen Maris at UCT. And Karen invited Fikile to come here and um, she's kindly agreed also to come to UWC. She did a seminar yesterday at UCT and to come to us and um, to talk about um, literacies. Um, <coughs> we have a, a series at UWC on multimodal literacies and we have um, seminars from time to time. So this is part of it and it's co-run with the Faculty of Arts at our university. Just to tell you a little bit about Figile, um, she's an assistant professor of early childhood education at the University of Texas in Austin where she's also affiliated faculty with African and African Diaspora Studies, the Native American and Indigenous Studies as well. Figile's research interests are centered on environmental and place-attuned early childhood studies that are situated within and responsive to young children's uneven inheritances of anthropogenic, anti-black and settler colonial worldings. This scholarship, which was published in many journals, including environmental education research, contemporary issues in early childhood, and the International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, and Environmental Humanities, is rooted in perspectives from post-human indigenous and black feminisms. And I think today, Figile is going to be sharing a chapter that she's just written in a book where um, Denise Newfield and myself have also written a, a, a chapter. It's, um, I think Candace Kuby is one of the editors. And um, it's, it looks like quite an interesting book. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've looked at the other chapters, but oh, I yeah. Well, I had a chance to review one chapter. Yes. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So welcome, Figile. We're really you. looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. So I want to preface this by saying that literacy is not my background at all, but it was really uh, great uh, for me to be a part of this uh, book um, that Viv just mentioned. So the book is titled Posthumanism and Literacy Education. Um, that's edited by Drs. Kubi, Specter, and Thiel, Thiel, I think. And it's going to be out shortly, I think, in July. Um, and so this chapter was co-authored um, with a doctoral student of mine, Jessica Rubin, um, whose uh, focus is in literacy education. And I'm going to be mostly reading, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, so the work that I'm going to be sharing um, has emerged from working within the very specific context of the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples in what's currently British Columbia, Canada. Uh, which is where I completed my doctoral studies. And more specifically, the site of the work um, is a group of early learning centers located ad adjacent to a mountain forest uh, in a suburb of Vancouver. So the childcare centers are somewhere here, and the university is completely surrounded by this forest, which is where we spent a lot of our time with the children and educators. So that's primarily the place from which I'll be speaking from today, though I'm hopeful that perhaps maybe what some of what has emerged from what I see as really very situated work um, has or might have some resonances with other places and spaces of early childhood education. 
So in thinking through the everyday pedagogical encounters with place that were a part of this work in, in which um, I see myself as very much embedded and, and implicated rather than an uh, outsider, um, the focus of my work was in, um, as Viv has mentioned, finding ways to unsettle the settler colonial and anti-black erasures that circulate even if inadvertently um, in environmental education or what's more commonly called nature education for young children. Um, and I also situate my work as resonant with recent critical perspectives in the field of early childhood education that have argued that unlike the often really universalizing and decontextualized images of childhood that are foregrounded by developmentally appropriate practice, which is a dominant discourse in our field, uh, childhood needs to be really explicitly located within the messiness of the real world, including uh, 21st century children's uneven inheritances of environmental damage. And so this is in, um, and I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, in really marked contrast uh, to the really romanticized connections between children and nature that are, are typically a part of outdoor um, forest preschools and kindergartens in North America. So where um, very much child-centered environmental education is typically coupled um, with connections to children's physical and emotional development, uh, Western scientific learning, and concerns about a nature deficit disorder. So in this particular work, um, my role was as a pedagogical facilitator, early childhood educator, and researcher. And I spent several hours a week uh, working alongside children aged three to five years old and early childhood educators, supporting them in inquiry-based uh, learning, uh, pedagogy and curriculum over the course of about three years. So I'll start with a little vignette that opens the chapter. A cluster of multi-age group childcare centers is located atop a mountain surrounded by forest in suburban British Columbia, Canada, on Coast Salish territories. Within a clearing in this forest, there's a small seasonal wetland. The wetland and surrounding forest have been a part of the children and educators and myself in pedagogical encounters for several years. Uh, many infants as well, in strollers, toddler, as well as toddlers and preschoolers, have all had some form of encounter with this place. Capturing the frictions between the multi-species inhabitants and the abandoned waste, the children call this place the junk place, and they also call it frog pond. Our encounters with this place also reflect these frictions. Black bear and coyote sightings have led, led us to a hasty retreat on more than one occasion. Muddy waters, ducks, dragonflies, tadpoles and frogs, children and educators often encounter each other. Human abandonments are also regular presences in this shared place. A safe, a desk, plastic tarp, coffee cups, plastic water bottles, abandoned construction materials and more. With its ever proliferating waste and murky waters, this might seem an unlikely place for educators and children to make a part of their curriculum making. However, staying with the tensions of learning with anthropogenic landscapes, this particular place is encountered as an example of what more than human place literacies might make possible within current times of environmental vulnerability. So uh, the work in the study um, is informed by recent work in early childhood studies that asserts that avoiding um, anthropocentric traps while nurturing children's relations to more than human life worlds in current <coughs> times requires some radical theoretical and pedagogical shifts. So these shifts include finding ways to foreground the enmeshment of children and more than human others in mutual ecological vulnerabilities. This orientation towards relationality and mutual entanglement, um, as indigenous knowledges have taught for millennia, requires practices that decenter the human as the sole agent acting upon a separated material or natural world. So this talk then, or this chapter, picks up on calls to shift practices of attentiveness towards the agency of more than human worlds and towards human and more than human entanglements. So configuring, um, considering how reconfiguring practices in early childhood education might include openings to more than human literacies, um, so the, this particular chapter is animated by the following questions. 
What might movements away from humanisms or anthropocentrisms mean for thinking alongside young children's literacies and place-based learning? What forms of ethical responsibility emerge from paying attention to children's relations with the imperfect places they co-inhabit with more than human others? What different kinds of literacy and place learning uh, might emerge from focusing upon children's relations with, for example, waste? So a particular interest was in expressions of situated more than human literacies then and in place-based education and what they might bring for children's learning with the anthropogenically damaged places they co-inhabit. And so the ways in which we engage with this uh, in this chapter is through um, what we call small stories, uh, situated visual and textual restoring of children's everyday encounters with this seasonal wetland turned waste dump, um, and, and what it offers as an inquiry into more than human place literacies. So the more than human place literacies that are storied in this chapter are grounded in an orientation towards more than human things and beings as actants that we uh, thought of as participating in placemaking and place storying in anthropogenic landscapes in uneven and fraught relations with humans. So in these understandings, places and their more than human inhabitants are not static and mute awaiting children's meaning making, but are themselves vibrant participants in shaping the world, including children's place literacies. So we highlight place literacies then as gesturing towards particular attention to the ways in which children's embodied and entangled relations with the places they co-inhabit with more than human others are themselves forms of literacy. So these place literacies uh, cannot be captured fully by text um, and we see them as perhaps interrupting Eurocentric human-centered views of literacy. And in settler colonial contexts such as this particular place on stolen um, Coast Salish territories, these literacies um, include centering place as a site of pedagogical encounter uh, with not only uh, more than human and, um, things, but also with this place as indigenous land um, and as a place of contested belonging. So by more than human literacies, um, what we are mean in this chapter is that we're interested in the ways that more than human presences, as I mentioned, actively participate in children's literacies. So for us, this means um, a shift away from viewing literacy as a practice that has been structured by certain humans to benefit other humans, or literacy as a possession whose elusive bestowment has kept afloat traditions, um, for instance, of environmental degradation. So this shift to the more than human in literacy unsettles the centrality of humans as subjects whose intelligence and agency enables their sole consumption and production of meaningful messages. So to understand literacy as more than human, we are um, of course drawing from post-humanist perspectives and indigenous knowledges, both of which in different ways trouble humanist understandings of agency as, unique, as a uniquely human possession. So posthumanist perspectives situate agency, and this is a quote from Barad, as attributable to a complex network of human and non-human agents, including historically specific sets of material conditions that exceed the traditional notion of the individual. Um, and alongside this, many diversely situated indigenous knowledges trouble the binaries created by attributing life to some entities and non-life to others and instead bring attention to the ways in which vitality extends through more than human worlds, worlds which are in inextricable relations of responsibility with humans. So the shift from viewing uh, agency as a possession to viewing agency as a doing distributed across multiple interrelated actors is one that we take up in our considerations of more than human literacies as enactments among entangled agentic entities. So we put this view then of more than human literacy to work by paying particular attention to the materialities, vitalities, and relationalities of more than human others, such as water, plants, frogs, and discarded things in children's everyday place encounters. And what we're trying to do, which 
I think is quite difficult, is uh, decentering the child as the, as the reader of more than human worlds, and instead considering the ways in which literacy learning emerges through children's co-constituted relations with elements of local place ecologies. Uh, so what we're doing is thinking how more than human place literacies might unsettle and complicate universalized framings of child development theories as a central way to understand children's learning. So in attending to place literacies, um, we try to resist an apolitical and innocent approach to place. So thinking of place not as a blank slate for meaning making, but as inherently storied, vibrant land, drawing from Tuck and Mackenzie. So as I mentioned, this means foregrounding this particular place as indigenous land where both human and more than human actors participate in the storing of places. So in this understanding, more than human bodies, place-specific stories, ontologies, and histories, as well as humans, are all lively and entangled participants in the shaping of place. Um, and this is helpful um, for us to unsettle an innocent framing of the stories that we tell in the chapter of children's everyday encounters. And we're also inspired by Margaret Somerville's work on place and literacy learning, um, which helps us to organize um, the children's encounters according to three elements of critical place literacies. Place stories, embodied relations, and contested places. So, you might wanna skip ahead here. Um, so for the remainder um, of the talk then, um, I'll story, um, or maybe put forward some of the particular stories that we included in the chapter in terms of children's everyday wetland encounters and how we think of them as more than human place literacies. And while these stories include attention to children's learning, um, we try and focus, as I mentioned, um, in relation to children's relations with agentic more than human worlds, um, as we try and seek out some other way, otherwise ways for making visible what might be happening. Um, that is to say, um, we follow selected small everyday encounters across both a discursive and materialized narrative field, and this is drawing from Haraway. So we're on the lookout for the ways in which these encounters emerge as mattering within material, discursive, settler colonial relations, and for the ways in which more than human entanglements might enact displacements of anthropocentric relations. And in telling these stories, rather than analyze their meaning for literacy um, learning, we, what we do in the chapter is we engage them diffractively and performatively to, to open up what else might be happening, might be noticed, and might be important to think with. Um, so for example, we read everyday embodied encounters alongside more than human play stories, alongside theories of waste and discard. And so in purposefully reading data through various embodied, storied, and theoretical apparatuses, our intent is to stay in the uncertain um, borderlands in ways that unsettle already known and easily definable human-centered interpretations of children's literacy learning. So here's one story. Children fling stones into the pond, intrigued by the ripplings that emerge as stones meet the surface of the water. On this particular morning, it is also the rusty metal safe that sits embedded in the soil at the edge of the water that beckons to children. As with previous encounters, the safe invites children's unsuccessful attempts to open it as they discuss their ever-changing ideas about what might be hidden inside. Perhaps making connections with the large muddy bear prints that we recently encountered on a walk to the forest, today, today the safe emerges as a nighttime home for a bear who keeps it locked up while looking for food in the forest. Alongside stories about the possible inhabitants of the metal safe, the safe also invites children's curiosities about how it got there. A garbage truck, the bear, a plane, and more emerge in child safe travel stories. Um, we remain conflicted, myself and the educators, about these encounters. This place, with its contradictory <coughs> nature, culture, assemblages, is a rich site of place learning and meaning making for the children. Yet we also wonder about the toxic effects of the metal safe on Frog Pond and its more than human inhabitants. 
together um, we consider how we might respond with children. Uh, and so we decide to read and think with work in critical discard studies um, that has brought a critical perspective to current dominant approaches to waste and waste management in North America, including the dominant focus on individual recycling. This work foregrounds connections between neoliberal waste governments, technocratic out of sight, out of mind waste management approaches, a lack of public engagement or concern with waste, waste's entanglement with proliferative consumption, and environmental injustices in waste disposal. Educators are simultaneously challenged and inspired by the suggestion that different ways of relating to waste and its persistence are needed in current times of anthropogenic damage. They consider how children's ongoing practices of caring for this place, such as through their stories and embodied encounters, include multiple modes of relating to and knowing waste. Thinking with uh, work that foregrounds the material, materiality and complexity of waste reminds us, um, an immediate uh, re reminds us to resist an immediate turn towards cleaning up this place. In considering how they might resist the urge to immediately make waste disappear, educators um, and myself consider how to reorient children's encounters as, as, as experimentations in learning to live with waste investigate waste legacies, and respond to waste's impact on more than human life. In these pedagogical perspectives, caring for waste necessarily means living with it and rec necessarily recognizes that waste is not going to go away. We decide for the time being to pay attention to children's waste stories and the ways in which they enact me messy caring and living with practices and begin by immersing ourselves in noticing children's learning with the entanglements of waste and more than human life. This, um, the safe always captures the attention of some of the children. Am amid refrains of the bare home story, as the group attempts to clamber over and open the safe, many other stories emerge from children's embodied encounters. One story emerges from children noticing that over time the safe does not seem to move. While children notice that the safe um, does not seem to have moved um, each time they return, they also notice um, with some encouragement that the soil around it accumulates and recedes. At times it is stuck hard on the safe, other times it is muddy and splattered along the sides. Sometimes the soil also invites children's investigations, yielding a bug, a worm. The safe's lively presence in this place over time opens up contradictory ways of knowing waste for the children its endurance, seeming immob immobility, and invitation to children's imaginative storytelling, which seems to reinforce waste dumps as, as places of forgetting about the enduring <coughs> ruination caused by anthropogenic waste. The seeming flourishing of animal life amidst the waste also perhaps figures into this, play, this as a place of forgetting. When a child inquires about the orange color race rust on the safe, this becomes a provocation for us educators to think how we might make present for children the ruinations of this place as a problem of now and into the future, and to think about how we might bring this enduring ruination to our practices with the children. So we decide to talk about how the water um, is making the safe weaker and changing it to rust, which is slowly going into the water. And this leads to further dialogues amongst children and educators about what might happen then when rust leaks into frog pond. So safe soil, metal, rust, water, and more than human life come together as what Latour calls matters of concern. And we engage in conversations about how we might respond. Uh, and contradictions emerge in these conversations. Um, for instance, one child tells an animated story about how the metal in the water might be actually protecting the frogs from coyotes. <laughs> so as children become affected by the potential toxicity of rust at Frog Pond, they become entangled in a fraught ethics, and the ethics which cannot be adequately explained by relying on apolitical and human-centered child development learning theories. Latimer and Puj de la Bella Casa describes, describe these complex ethics as forms of caring and reciprocal obligation that emerge with uneven power relations where we are an obligation towards something that might have no power to enforce this obligation upon us. In other words, actions of care are performed even if we are not forced to it by a moral order or policy. 
So amidst conversations about how we might respond to potentially toxic metal degradation and leakages and to the ever accumulating waste in this place, um, the more than human life continues to beckon to children. Children's curiosities and practices of noticing are particularly attuned to the frog companions um, that emerge here every spring. The jelly-like sacs holding the frog eggs fascinate the children as they swirl around in the water. As they point and look closely, children often remind each other of the care needed with the fragile egg sacs. One, child, one day a child says to the others as they crouch down, rain boots immersed in the murky, murky water, if you touch it, they will die. While for some children, a sense of the egg's fr fragility seems to emerge from looking closely at the egg, for others this learning happens when hands inadvertently squish um, a sack to much dismay. So to quote Eben Crooksy, thinking with care is a vital requisite of being in interdependent worlds. Care can generate ontological resonances, fostering relations among lively beings. Educators notice um, children's curiosities about the becoming of frog eggs into frogs, and after conversa conversations about the ethical tensions of taking frog eggs away from their home, um, it's decided to bring some of the eggs, water, and algae to the classroom with the plan to return um, the animals when they grow into frogs. In the classroom encounters, more than human literacies emerge in the form of material discursive entanglements amongst frog pond waste eggs tadpoles, frogs, frog stories, water, frog life cycle images, and read aloud frog story books, and more. Looking inside the glass bowl, um, holding the eggs, also becomes a daily ritual for several children as they participate in caring for the eggs um, as they become tadpoles, such as by walking to frog pond to collect water and algae. We read um, about the conservation benefits of caring for tadpoles from the wild, learning that tadpoles often survive better in caring rare and release initiatives due to predators and amphibian, amphibian sensitivities to changing weather. We also read about the extinction risks facing many frog species due to climate change and other human cause factors. And we stay with the unresolved tensions that emerge from considering the ethics of classroom animal enclosure. Alongside these tensions, multiple literacies perhaps emerge in the entanglements of science, place, materials, and more than human life. In the classroom, Frog Pond participates as an active presence in children's learning. As many children explain to their families that the eggs and tadpoles come from Frog Pond, and we be going back to see their friends when they are frogs. Perhaps this might be an example of the type of science study that Anna Ting uh, terms as an emergent in a passionate immersion in the lives of the non-humans being studied. In the classroom, through their materialized uh, place encounter, place connections, frog eggs, tadpoles, and frogs come to matter in children's literacy learning in ways that might seem to us, at least, to resist normalization as passive objects of scientific learning. Done. In pedagogical practices um, with children, um, educators have been engaged in the challenge of bringing anti-colonial ethics to the forefront. An important source of inspiration comes from reading together land education, decolonizing, and place-based education literature. Um, this work helps us to consider place as intrinsically storied and to find ways to foreground indigenous place stories. The educators come together regularly in critically collaborative dialogues um, with myself as the facilitator to discuss um, some of these readings and how they might inform their practices. Educators are inspired and challenged by recent work on land education within settler colonial contexts. This work centers land as indigenous and atten attends to the entanglements of place with settler colonialism and shows how indigenous, and this is a quote, relationships to land and place are diverse, specific, and ungeneralizable, from Tuck, McKenzie, and McCoy. So this work inspires some educators to seek ways to foreground indigenous land stories while keeping multiple contradictory place stories in tension. For instance, educators' learning emerges with uh, indigenous land stories alongside scientific place stories, such as the frog life cycle children encounter in books, and alongside children's embodied storytelling, such as the story of how the metal protects frogs, amongst other place stories. 
And so alongside the frog pond encounters, indigenous Coast Salish drum stories um, emerge as one way to encounter multiple land stories. So educators at the center have arranged for a Coast Salish drumming encounter. The drumming group teaches us um, songs translating the words for us each time. We sing a welcome song and a song traditionally sung to let the bears know that people are in the forest. We also hear a story of the drums that are a vibrant part of this gathering and listen to how indigenous moose hide, hide and cedar wood, as more than human kin to in Coast Salish peoples, have come together in the making of the drums. So songs, touch, visualities, human and more than human bodies come together enacting um, what we found to be joyful connections in this encounter. So the bear song, as the children name it, um, emerges as part of our encounters with Frog Pond, as children often sing it on our walks. Um, uncertainties remain amongst us about the meaning of these encounters as anti-colonial in relation to um, encounters with living indigenous knowledges. For example, tensions emerge in thinking with these encounters as consumption of indigenous cultures by non-indigenous children and educators. And risks remain ever present uh, in these encounters, such as in enforcing colonial, colonialisms through a, a politics of recognition. Doubts also surface as we continue to try out ways to stay with the tensions that these encounters bring while deepening our engagements with living in placed indigenous cultures and knowledges within settler colonial relations. I'm gonna skip ahead here. Um, and so amidst the tensions and uncertainties of pre presencing indigenous land stories through oral bear drum songs, we see them as beginnings um, in making visible marginalized stories of this place as indigenous land. And so we see these encounters as also enacting more than human place literacies that create cracks in our Eurocentric human, humanist understandings, approaches to literacy, and the colonial erasures that they un often unknowingly enact. So to finish up, after a heavy rain, uh, we release the frogs to the pond amidst um, echoing shouts of, good, of goodbye frogs. Soil, water, and rain boots move children towards spontaneous muddy clay that one child calls a sticky situation as mud is flung into the air and children purposely get stuck in the mud. Thinking with stickiness seems fitting in encountering the multiple contradictions of the, the ever-present waste, frog life, mud, ducks, and bear prints, and in considering our implicatedness in these precarious ecologies. As educators and children continue to inhabit the uncertainties of what might constitute ethical responsibility in this particular place, we decide to organize for the removal of the metal safe and some of the other larger waste that has accumulated here. When we next return, the metal safe and much of the large construction debris have been removed, but plastic bottles, coffee cups, a discarded bag of foam, and other materials are still scattered around. So in this particular place, it seems impossible to avoid bearing witness to waste, even, if, even as we act to remove it often. And re we remain aware that even out of sight waste continues to have multiple indeterminate effects that are beyond our ways of knowing. So to finish up here, I return to the questions that I posed at the beginning um, in relation to you know, what are some of the possibilities that might be enacted by unsettling anthropocentricisms in place literacies. So amidst our always imperfect removal responses to the waste landscapes we co-inhabit, um, what we are trying to say in our chapter is that the very small mundane stories that we describe suggests that children's place learning um, in many ways exceeded human-centered approaches to waste management or human-centered approaches to literacy learning. And these more than human place literacies um, emerging from children's always fraught participation in settler colonial waste landscapes perhaps might be seen as challenging anthropocentric disposability as a normalized response. And so while we often know universal solutions to the question of what types of literacies are needed to ethically and hopefully inhabit what even Kirksey and Anna Tsing call blasted and damaged landscapes in settler colonial contexts, 
perhaps the small stories um, might uh, point to some, some measure of generative possibilities for young children learning to pay attention to and live with asymmetrical more than human relations. And that's all I have. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much in the talk. Um, yesterday at UCT, what we did is we had about five minutes, I think, or so, just to discuss Figuile's talk and to maybe come up with some questions. So perhaps we could do that and then um, engage with her. Okay. Um, I'm Veronica Mitchell. I'm looking at post-humanism in terms of medical education and obstetrics and particularly what the curriculum is doing in relation to the students and their responsibility and um, the different age age of courses. Hello, my name is Florence. I'm looking at um, the military, military landscape and um, just to see how the military people, personnel, navigate within the landscape. Mm. Okay, um, I'm Tiana Nathan. I'm from the from UWC Anthropology and Sociology Department, mm -hmm. and I'm interested in. I work with a local Rastafari bush doctors, mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking at the relationship between bush doctors and plants, and I'm interested in the ways in which plants, um, as subjects and active beings, mm -hmm. um, influence and produce a change in humans. So. Um, I'm very happy that you came along with this work because I, looking at the more than you, or the, largely the post-humanist domain is a very interesting um, move in the literature, so yeah. Fikilia, <laughs> you can tell them what I'm doing. <laughs> no shame, I'm, I've had the privilege of working with Fikilia over the last couple of days, but yeah, I'm very interested in um, children and post-humanism and delighted that you're working in this very, very important yeah, in a significant way, I would say. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm Sadiq. Uh, I'm a lecturer at CPUT in civil engineering, uh, and I've introduced uh, digital storytelling into the engineering curriculum, getting students to tell stories. Uh, and, and I'm kind of inter I'm interested in interrogating the, the geomatics, cartography, sort of knowledge base uh, from post-humanist. I'm Arona, and um, I work with Verve at GWC, so I can't avoid being exposed to post-humanism and resist strongly. I've got a six-year-old child, so mm -hmm. I'd, uh, it just, I don't know, it was just so interesting mm -hmm. for me to hear, mm -hmm. to hear about children in your talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Dumo Bowen, University of Limpopo and I'm interested in the delivering of um, teaching and learning spaces. Um, you know, at times I ask myself, why is it that uh, in that part of the world, you know, the border, you know, people eat and they throw things, mm. you know, as if, you know, animals, you know, animals when they mark their territories. Yeah. So mm -hmm. after eating, it seems as if I'm announcing I was here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but then, I'm actually a new convert, a disciple of the And of course, um, I've been reading a lot of um, mm. work because um, I'm also a leader in the implementation of a new program, the Far in Phase mm. at the university. And um, every day when I go to work, I pass you know, a few primary schools and I see uh, early in the morning how children throw things in, around. Mm. Thank you. I'm Teresa Giorza. I'm from Johannesburg. I'm at FITS. Um, also in foundation, in the foundation studies division. I've been working with um, looking at uh, early learning and um, ways of learning with, I think it's, that's the idea of, the idea of learning as, as worlding or learning with um, material and human, non-human, and so looking at the relationalities and how the relations we have with inside and outside, how they impact on on um, relations of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, 
I feel like I want to hear more about everyone else's work. So interesting. Well, maybe it will come through the questions yes, and that yeah. sort of thing. So interesting. So can I start? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I'm very interested in knowing how because the you, you spoke about the safe, but uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, the majority of the work was about the frogs, mm -hmm. um, and I think within I mean because I've been getting a lot of critique mm -hmm. um, because we also I'm also one to descend to the human in relations in multi-species relations and so it is easier to think of animals mm -hmm. right um, mm -hmm. but when we think of other inhuman things um, I'm interested in knowing how you sort of navigate that and what is your response on them being plastic bottles plants um, as being um, active um, subjects or active agents as opposed to uh, passive objects that are manipulated by humans because um, and at the same time also <laughs> playing devil's advocate um, you you speak the stories come from children right mm -hmm. so it is still human centered so how do you navigate between you know the post humanist today when we're still getting I just want to get because mm -hmm. that's the critique that I've been getting that it's still a human story so how do you get into the human <coughs> Yeah. Can someone answer that for me? Like, that's like the big question, right? Or maybe we can I, talk about Because I don't, ways. yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult. And I always, one of my responses is that, like, decentering the human doesn't mean the human is not mm. present, right? And, right? and that's also, I find, a really important critique, too, because um, often there's tensions in relation to... Um, what does it mean to do post-humanism when there are all these inequalities within the human, right? And so I think it's always important to like underline that post-human is not like beyond or over the human, like that the human is present. But it's for me, it's thinking about the relationality or the entanglements or um, the ways in which the more than human world um, is always storing places, often in ways that we're not even like aware of. Like there were things happening with the safe and the bacteria and the water that we were not privy to, to knowing, right? So the safe is never just something that's there waiting for the children to imagine the spare story. Like the safe is always participating and changing what's happening at Frog Pond. So shifting that thinking. Um, but yeah, the the decentering in telling the story, I think, is always a challenge um, in terms of, um, yeah, how, because also of the limits of language as well in like telling a story um, in a way that, um, yeah, does not necessarily place the children at the center, but is not making the children invisible either. Um, but I think also, and not wanting to kind of generalize children, but I think children also have a wonderful way of telling stories in ways that animate things, <laughs> that it's more easier in some ways sometimes, I find in the ways children talk about things mm -hmm. and their liveliness in ways that we might find you know, odd and weird, but the children, I find they have a way of doing that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that's centering children again, but <laughs> often that's really interesting to me. Um, and I found like the new materialist work is really great in terms of um, concepts and ideas and language for thinking about the material, not necessarily animal, but like things and their liveliness. So I, I found a lot of inspiration from like Barad's work and um, Ray Doughty in terms of just the language um, in kind of speaking back to that kind of critique of, you know, um, what, like what, does it, what do you mean that things have agency? But then also at the same time, indigenous knowledges, um, I think that's also been an important counter is that there are many, as I mentioned, diversely situated indigenous knowledges where we've always talked about the liveliness of things and not limited it to things that are you know, so-called alive, right? So there's also that. Um, knowledge to draw from as well, which you know is contentious as well because 
Um, for instance, for me, in drawing from Coast Salish ideas, as someone who's not from Coast Salish, I think you know it's always to think about how to do how to do those things, those things really carefully, you know, and not in a consumptive and appropriative way. And it's not about saying um, post-humanism is the same as indigenous ontology. Like there, there are some really significant differences, and in, indigenous knowledges are very place specific and situated as well. So thinking about how to engage with those knowledges but in really careful ways as well. So I don't know, that's a really messy kind of muddled answer, but it's a great question and it's something I think um, is like an ongoing struggle for me in my writing in terms of that non-anthropocentric mode of storytelling that's not wanting to disappear the children but to decenter right? Yeah. The child is like the sole meaning maker, right? How is meaning made in relationship? Mm. <laughs> Maybe other people have thoughts as well. Yes. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, so enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Um, I, I noticed today that you spoke a lot about the more than human. Mm -hmm. And then at odd times mentioned inhuman. I didn't hear non-human. And I wondered how you choose what you use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think for me, I've intentionally not used the non-human in my work. Um, mm -hmm. It's just kind of not like to say there's anything wrong with people who use that term, but for me, just the more than human is something that I resonate with more. Not as like, I didn't, I didn't like kind of the negativity of like mm -hmm. the non-human. Um, and also there's kind of a, a history of that, right, in terms mm -hmm. of who's been kind of seen as non-human. So to me, non-human in some ways still keeps like some kind of a binary in place. So I, more than human is not perfect either, but it's the one that I've kind of stuck with and tried to be consistent with. And the inhuman? I don't think I really use inhuman unless I'm like citing or mm -hmm. like quoting someone that uses that. But inhuman. So, so I tried to avoid. Mm -hmm. I tried to avoid non-human, and then I found so many quotes, yeah. like from Haraway and other people yeah. who mm -hmm. use non-human. Yes, yeah. right. So then you are caught. Yes. Um, so yeah, if I'm using a quote, then yeah. yeah. But like for my own, I prefer, more, and it's just a preference. Like I wouldn't say it's bad that you're using non. -human. It's just for me, it's um, more affirmative. A more affirmative term to use. I don't okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I sort of wanted to find out from her, mm -hmm. you know, about the military spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever thought of, you know, mm -hmm. after the war or before the war? Because I know after the war in Mozambique, whatever, you still have a lot of mm -hmm. landmines. I don't know. Sort of was interested in. Oh, my, my. <laughs> um, my, I'm doing my study here in in Cape Town, and it's a lot about how the former military men navigate and speak to the landscapes that they live in. So um, I am going back to Figler's work. I like the issue of place and the more than human, where we see that the landscape and the more than human within that landscape actually determine how people negotiate or how people proceed within those spaces. So um, yes, in, uh, in, during the, in the post-combat uh, areas, you'd see there are landmines, there's um, actually shell buildings and all that. So it is those things that I am interested in, understanding how people, the relationships or the entanglements between the military and the spaces. the issue of waste, you know, whether we are deliberately forgetting about waste, mm -hmm. or we need to accept that there's nothing we can do about it, mm -hmm. and uh, how can we sort of uh, come to that realization about you know, waste, the dumping of safes, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, other materials that are not biodegradable. 
uh, how can we question ties? I know children will find their way, but uh, us, we start occupying the high moral ground. You know? mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I think that's a hard one, and I think because I think the the easy response is that kind of moralistic kind of kind of um, response. I mean, even the way we teach about waste in schools, like I, I don't know if it's the same here, but in Canada. It's very much through the three R's, like reduce, reuse, recycle. recycle. Yeah. <laughs> but usually, I would say most of the focus is on the recycle mm. part. So mm. that's really how we, and it's very like individualistic, kind of a neoliberal waste management kind of approach. Um, that puts it very much on you know, the individual. Um, and there's very less emphasis, I find, on the reuse part. Um, and not much emphasis on the consumption, like how much we're consuming mm. in the first place. Um, and also that actually much of the waste, even though I realize what you're saying in terms of litter and so on, much of the waste that is causing the most damage, like worldwide, planetary, is industrial waste. So Canada, for instance, is mm. the world's largest producer um, of industrial waste. That actually, most of it ends up in other places, right? Not in not in Canada. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which is, you know, ironic because Canada has this image mm. as this like green yeah. place, but um, largely because, you know, the mining and the oil and gas and all of that. Mm. So, how can, I guess, one of the things I'm interested in is how we can bring attention to that aspect. Not to say that there's nothing we can do as individuals, but like to have more of a accountability or accounting for like how unevenly distributed the production and then the people who feel the impacts of waste, like where waste goes. <coughs> um, and I think that's hard because we're so stuck in that, like I said, that neoliberal waste management. Mm. Um, and even um, there's some, some really great work in the area of critical discard studies. Yeah, um, and I was like, quite disheartened to learn that actually most of what we put in the recycle bin actually ends up in the dump anyway, mm -hmm. like over 80% of it. Mm -hmm. um, but then we actually feel so good when we recycle, <laughs> but it's actually not much of it ends up in the dump anyway or somewhere else. So, um, and actually there's a huge like energy consumption too that's associated with like waste removal, like picking up the garbage, mm. like, and it's like a big business mm. <laughs> as well, and the trucks like spew all kinds of things into the environment. So when you look at it all, it actually, you know, even the waste management strategies are, are not necessarily doing a lot of good, even though they make us, you know, feel good when mm. we sort things correctly in the right bin. And, so how to, how to get at some of those knots and um, like the big picture. And not to mm -hmm. say that, you know, like I said, that there is no individual responsibility, but how to think, how to situate it, that responsibility within a broader issue around rampant consumptive capitalism, right? Um, and then I don't know how you do that with young children, but I think for us it was part of the, that you know, wait, not rushing right away to clean up was from reading some of that literature. And like, so if we just clean it up and it's out of sight, then, mm. you know, are we kind of repeating that? But then, you know, there's also the ethical thing, like, okay, we can't just leave that safe there. Um, so, you know, we do. And even though I've left that center, they do regularly still clean up mm. this place, but it literally is a dump, like it's the waste never goes away. And so I think that's also interesting for children to like, to come to this place where we, like the waste never goes away, mm -hmm. even though they do this cleanup. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't really have an answer, <laughs> but I, um, for me it was quite profound, like just to learn how, yeah, how steeped in capitalism still is waste management and how it's not really getting at some of the root issues and causes. I think we'll take one more question because I know we we have run out of time. If people oh. do need to leave, they can. Mm -hmm. But Sadiq, would you like? Yeah, I just wanted to ask about, you know, I've been thinking about this indigenous ontologies mm -hmm. and and 
and as you said, it's not just one thing, right? But, but I find that some of the post-humanist literature doesn't really uh, engage with the specificity of it. So, so I understand that, that post-humanism is like a becoming minoritarian where you're always there for the, 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 uh, the little guy, as it were. Um, but, but how do you... How do you assess whether an indigenous ontology is right? Not, I mean, it's not, it's not the right word, to, but, but are we not, in fighting for an indigenous ontology, sometimes fighting for more destruction? You understand? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, ca I can't... Destruction in terms of, um, like, appropriation? Of the knowledge is, is yeah, I don't use the term of reverse apartheid, but but um, innocent. Innocent. Like, is it always innocent? Is the indigenous mm. knowledge always necessarily innocent? I mean, in South Africa, uh, it, in a, a koi knowledge system is different from a Kosa knowledge system. Is mm. different from a Zulu, from a Insane. you know. So so, just saying. I'm, I'm there for an in indigenous ontology. Uh, you, you could be uh, fighting for something that's in, in, intensely anthropocentric or humanist. Mm -hmm. It could be, it could be that. It doesn't, it doesn't, I, I find it uncomfortable where indigenous ontologies are always painted with this innocent brush, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, whereas if you engage with some indigenous stories, you say this is intensely anthropocentric or humanist, but in another guise? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I mean, I've tried in my work to um, be as much as possible very much situated within the place where I worked. Um, but you know, even there, sometimes I use the term Coast Salish, even though you know, there's like five different um, mm. particular clans that lay claim to that particular area. and. You know, there are some resonances, but there are also some differences between them. And so um, sometimes using the term co-salish as well is problematic. Um, and I mean, I don't really have a straight answer, but I think for me it's been important, even though there is, I, I would say I am kind of guilty of sometimes doing that broad brush, is that it's been kind of an intentional like for me a citational kind of practice and resistance because um, just to kind of resist always like the Euro-Western citation when we're talking about the more than human, when there are these, mm -hmm. yes, diversely situated and very different knowledges, but that have always for millennia acknowledged mm -hmm. the vibrancy and liveliness of the mm -hmm. more than human. So for me it's more like been like a citational kind of resistance practice um, but I definitely appreciate your point about the specificity and that not all indigenous knowledges um, view the more than human world in a you know in necessarily in the same way and not all indigenous knowledges are non anthropocentric um, but yeah like I said for me it's been more about that citational kind of acknowledgement of well my teachings from my grandma, for instance, like um, the mountains in Swaziland, the ways in which I've been taught about them, they're like our relative, and so I, it's just for me like a, yeah, like I said, a citational mm -hmm. practice of wanting to um, not always be citing Deleuze, even though I really like Deleuze yeah. and Barad, <laughs> but I think, you know. You like Deleuze. Just yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But absolutely about the specificity, I think it's really, really important. Um, and I have, you know, had many in indigenous scholar mentors from North America, from the Canadian and the US context, who often remind me of that. Like indigenous knowledges are really specific, so you, mm. you have to be really be careful when you're talking about indigenous knowledges. So um, it's an important reminder for sure. Yeah, let's choose. Yeah, which one? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so what's right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and especially because of the fact that many, uh, many of us are immigrants, 
Uh, I mean, do I choose Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Khoi, San? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or can I choose all of them? Yeah, just do a very long And sometimes it helps like the where, right? Like I was working in a very specific mm, yeah. territory. So whose territory are you on? Mm -hmm. If you're doing work that's really like place based, like but it yeah. makes sense, right? To think with who's mm -hmm. But then I don't it can But in South Africa then <laughs> yeah. yes. it's very complicated. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, do you can want I just to make a yeah. quick okay. comment yeah. on that, yeah. right? So yeah. I said I work with the uh, Rastafara community in the Western Cape, and of course it's a very contested, tenuous mm. topic, right? Because we're speaking about many things, mm. Mm. political issues of land, mm. because they, the Rastafara community <coughs> identify themselves as um, Khoisan ancestors, mm. the original inhabitants of the Western Cape. So one, I think it's important um, that these so this kind of research um, um, th that people are doing it because mm. it is there's this perception that um, because of global flows of technology and information and all of that that people are becoming s somewhat globalized and they're losing but the reality is that particularly in very small communities I call them the forgotten communities um, uh, the small dorpies, the small towns that you find um, in the Western Cape, that, that people cling to this sort of African ontology as a way to fight against globalization. So it is interesting that, um, and I think it's important that we do this kind of research to show where we are and how people are fighting uh, for the belief systems as opposed to sort of globalized understanding of mm. how the world works and it is going against a, a Euro modern um, understanding of the world and I say that that kind of African ontology is sort of the taken for granted aspects of research because when I investigate all you know when I go through the literature I see but it is there that kind of thing ontology or other than human or more than human ontology exists but it's not spoken about because it's it's not a, a, a Euro modern way of writing and mm. understanding uh, multi species relationships. So um, it is difficult, but yeah. <laughs> isn't, isn't that, that research is complicated? It's but can I just ask so, so, so your uh, so Rastafari community, do they identify? I, I mean, because that too is a very interesting thing. They identify as Khoi and San mm. with, a, with, a, with a foreign religion. Right, so it's very interesting. No, 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 it's very interesting because because it, it is very interesting because it is a foreign religion, but that's why I am endeavoring in this research because it is how why are you appropriating a foreign uh, culture? It's not a religion. You see, it is so. There's a difference between they say the culture and the religion. So why are you appropriating a foreign culture, culture um, within? Yeah. And it's got to do a lot with you go back to the history of of land um, issues um, and issues of identity and all of those things. So for me, that is also one of the reasons why. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I so think unfortunately it is so interesting and we yeah. could talk on all afternoon, I think. Yeah. But thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.